Hello class, this is the lecture for 2-3 from the Forrester textbook and we are talking about periodic functions. Remember from chapter one, we started mentioning these, how these were gonna be the focus for this year. Well now, here they come. Pythagoras is gonna become your homeboy. You are gonna spend lots of time with circles and trig and you'll see how amazingly uh, explanative this, this system is, how it can just explain a lot of things and cover a lot of ground and describe so much of the natural world. Trigonometry is a really useful, practical side of math. We have a bit of this that's already in our heads. We have some things that we're, we're pretty used to. So you, you're used to, hopefully, this phrase, this weird uh, mnemonic device, SOKOTOA, that there's the adjacent side, the opposite side, and the hippopotamus, that together these parts of a right triangle, we just talk about the ratio of two parts. It makes up uh, the opposite over the hypotenuse makes up sine, the adjacent over the hypotenuse makes cosine, the opposite over the adjacent makes tangent. You're pretty used to these, and you can keep thinking these if, if, if and only if, you will think about reference triangles. So you remember when you look at a circle, it's, uh, we said that trigonometry is most fundamentally about a circle, that you can, you can draw a triangle in the first quadrant, and you could even draw a triangle in the, uh, the second quadrant, uh, but it's not gonna be a right triangle. The only way for you to keep drawing triangles in the other quadrants and still be able to use your Sokotoa stuff, that was pretty not straight, is if you think in terms of reference triangles. These angles in here are all reference angles and all of your opposite over adjacent kind of stuff will work just fine if you're drawing reference triangles, okay? So you gotta, if you wanna keep your Sokotoa, you gotta learn reference angles. One requires the other. So it's, it's pretty similar to what you're used to. Things aren't that different yet, that we've got uh, cosine and sine. Sokotoa works pretty good here. And instead of a hypotenuse, it's going to be, since we're on a circle, it's gonna be r for the radius of the circle. That's consistently always going to be our hypotenuse. Theta, this Greek letter here that we've been using here that hopefully you're getting used to writing is uh, just the default variable for the angle of rotation. And when we solve with theta, it means it applies for any angle. That's the great thing about doing it with variables instead of particular numbers. It applies everywhere. Now, you're used to saying that sine is the ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse, but if we are on a circle now, we can see over there that that opposite angle is actually how far up have we gone. And if we define it as the ratio of up to the radius, then we'll be able to explain how it could be negative. That if we end up in the second, or the third and the fourth quadrant going down, that that will be a negative amount of up that we've done. So that's how sine can be negative. Similarly, you're used to defining cosine as adjacent over hypotenuse, but over here in our circle now, we're gonna define it as how far right have you gone compared to the radius. So again, this will allow us to have negative values in the second and third quadrant. It's, it's something that's more useful than just Sokotoa on right triangles in the first quadrant. This is a bigger definition that gets all of the old definition that you're used to and more. It has more explanatory power. And so your, your triangles that you work, but the, if you, you've got to draw them as reference triangles in order to keep thinking Sokotoa kinds of thoughts. So take a second here, make sure that you are tracking with what I'm saying, pause the video, draw a 347 degree angle in standard position, and then come back and add the, the reference triangle so that you understand what the pieces are that we're talking about. All right, so you've, you've drawn that. Let's, let's walk through what you just did. You said we're on 
a circle here and we're spinning 347 degrees. Well, that's definitely more than zero, definitely more than 90, definitely more than 180, definitely more than 270, but less than 360. So it's less than a full turn. It's somewhere over here, somewhere in the, in the fourth quadrant there is our 347 degree angle. But this reference triangle that we're going to need to be able to deal with things and to draw triangles there is going to consist of this reference angle here. So how much, how much further do we have to go to get to 360? Well, 347 minus, uh, 360 minus 347 is 13. So this has got a reference angle of 13. We're going to draw a right triangle here. We're going to say this angle is 13. That's what we're going to be dealing with, our reference triangle that way. Now, we can do this with circles of any size, and we can use this information then wherever we've gone in the Cartesian coordinate system of positive x's, negative x's, positive y's, negative y's. This now allows us to define sine and cosine and tangent from Sokotoa if we use a reference triangle. So again, pause the video, sketch it out, write down what sine, cosine, and tangent are for the angle going through the point negative 12, negative 5. You might have to use a little bit of Pythagoras, but go ahead and work out those three trig functions. And we're back. Let's, let's do that now. So you should have a drawing that looks like this. You've got the coordinate system. You've gone uh, negative 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you've gone down 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you're somewhere over there. So the angle has got an initial side here, and then it goes through that angle there, and that's the angle that we've turned. Now, with that, we've made a reference triangle that looks like this. It's got a side over here where we went down 5 and a side up here where we went left 12. What is the hypotenuse of this triangle? Well, Pythagoras tells us that if we've got a side of 5 and a side of 12, that'll get us the hypotenuse squared. That's 25 plus 144. That's 169 and the square root of 169 is 13. So this side over here must be 13. So now we can look at this reference triangle and using this reference angle right in there, if we look out across and say where are my uh, opposite over hypotenuse? So the sine of this angle here is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. Did you get that? Is that the value that you got? Double check the negative. Make sure you understand whether it's positive or negative. It's, it should be, we would expect this to have a negative sign value because the ratio of up to radius is got a down in it, the opposite of up. So opposite means negative. Same kind of thing over here when we try to find sine or cosine. We've got adjacent over hypotenuse. That means that the adjacent piece was negative 12, the hypotenuse was 13, so our cosine is negative. Again, the ratio of right to radius, we went left, so that's a negative amount of going right. Lastly, there is tangent, and tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. Well, a negative over a negative, that makes a positive, so we can simplify that to 5 over 12. Do you see how this works? You can still use all of your great Sokotoa stuff that you learned before. You just have to apply it to the reference triangle, which may have some negative features if you go left or down. Now, the easiest thing that we like to do in trigonometry is use a circle with radius 1. 1 is fantastic to use as a radius because if we ever need to go anywhere bigger, we just multiply by how much bigger is the hypotenuse, is the radius. Multiplying 1 by anything, real simple. Also, this gives us very, very easy math for looking at sine and cosine uh, because if cosine is the 
right displacement uh, compared to the radius, and the radius is always going to be 1 on the unit circle, then it's just the right displacement. It's just how far right did you go uh, inside of a circle of radius 1. And the same with cosine. If we're comparing how far up did you go to the radius, if the radius is 1, then sine is just going to be the y value of where we are on the unit circle. So this is super, super helpful. Now, we need to think about what are some possible values, therefore, that this, this helps us a lot in understanding what sine and cosine as functions do. As we look at what are the cycles of sine, we can say that that's just y, that sine theta will consistently just tell us about the y value. So if we look at this circle here, we see at the beginning our y value starts off at 0. And then as we progress through more and more angles and building and building up, our y value makes it all the way up there to a height of 1 before it starts falling back down again, back down to 0. And then as we keep going further, it goes all the way down to negative 1 before it comes back. So this, this cycle, this pattern of what sine value does, sine just goes from 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1 to 0. And that just, as you go around the circle, that's just going to happen over and over and over again. These are the possible values for sine. What about for uh, cosine? What about if we try to say what's happening to our x value? Well, the x value starts all the way at its most extreme point, at 1. And then if we're just looking at x, it's going to fall down to 0 there. And then it's going to fall even further down to negative 1. And then it'll come back up to 0 and back up to 1. So this pattern, this cycle of what does cosine do, it's the same numbers, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, as sine, but they start in a different spot. They, finish, they start and finish in different spots, progressing through these numbers. Here is an animation that does that much better than your calculator can. As we move around the circle here, you can see the different uh, values that are happening. At the far right, there's an extreme of x, an extreme of x to the left, extreme of y at the top and at the bottom. And as you just go around the circle here, this is a really great animated uh, GIF or GIF. Oh, I don't even know. Maybe I've made somebody mad. But that as we go around, we're increasing and decreasing and having different patterns that just repeat over and over again. And this one is great because it's got the reference triangles uh, in there as well. Now, one of the vocabulary words that you might not be used to there from the textbook is to talk about when are things increasing and decreasing. So if we look at uh, the sine wave, so here's a drawing of sine. This is y equals sine x. We can see that it is, it is increasing over here. So I'll color the increasing part in green. It's going up and up and up. And then it switches to going down. But over here, there's another time when it is going up again. But we can see that it was going down on this part of its life cycle. Same kind of thing with uh, cosine. If it starts up at 1 and then cycles through, this vocabulary word, I, I think it's just a natural, intuitive English word. It's not so different. But that it is, it is decreasing here and increasing here. So it should, be, it should be pretty obvious what those words mean, increasing and decreasing. But words that you might not be as uh, familiar with is concave up and concave down, concavity. Have you heard of these before? I'll try some other colors for those. I'll do blue and orange. So concave down, if you take your hand and you make a little um, uh, umbrella type shape there. This is concave down. It's something that's that's caving in. It's 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 cave concave facing down. Versus if you make a bowl with your hand, that's concave up. You can see both ends of my hand are pointed up. Concave down, concave up. So if we look at the sine one first, that's pretty obvious. Here's concave down in this region. And if we look at the cosine one, we just take that and we chop it up, and we've got concave down here and concave down there. 
but if we want to say where is it concave up, and you can just use your hand to sort of make a little test on the graph. Here is concave up and concave up on those graphs. So I hope you've heard those words before, but if not, there's a good explanation. Take the little hand test with it. Now, your calculator will uh, be able to graph these for you. I've already graphed y equals sine x, y equals cos x. There's an example of a uh, less hand-drawn version. And the last vocabulary word that we need to cover is this word period. And it just means how long until the pattern repeats. And anything, any periodic function will have a period by definition. So you could have something that just uh, I don't know, is a, a mountain range uh, that is got, let's just have fun with it there. So there's a kind of sine wave looking mountain range and uh, it's, it's, it's got a pattern and, and you might be tempted to say, well here if I make it up to this point, I make it to that point again over there. So is the period that interval? and you, you've got to say, I need to be at the same spot on the wave. So, so let's take this mountain range and let's make sure we can draw another one here. If we add what the, the pattern repeats and you go up the mountain and down the mountain and it just keeps going on and on forever like that. So what you're trying to measure is when do I get back the same value? When I plug in some particular x value here and I get a y value, yes I get the same y value over here, but I'm not at the same place on the cycle. That's not right. If I don't get back to the same place on the cycle till all the way over there. So this distance here from the same moment to the same moment is called the period. And, and you can see, if I could draw, that this would be the same everywhere. That to get from this bottom of the mega mountain to the bottom of that mountain, from top to top, um, not from this zero to that zero, that's not right, but to get from that zero to the next time a mountain is starting, to be able to have a consistent spot of saying when do I get from the same moment in the life of the curve of the function to that same moment again. That's the definition of a period. So I would like for you to uh, read over the, always, the book is very helpful with the reading summary and, and, and analysis there. Those are very helpful and the review questions, if there's any one of those that you don't know how to do, you should be keeping this knowledge, then take a stab at it, we can talk about it in class. Always go over the reading and the questions just for your own sake to make sure that you're keeping up and not losing knowledge as the year progresses. But do come with problems one and two done for class and we will uh, discuss that and do some more problems about periodic functions.